thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Office of Higher Education Public Engagement Call. My name is Winnie Sullivan, and I am the Deputy Commissioner at um, Office of Higher Education, better known as OHE. On behalf of Commissioner Olson, I'm sorry, and the entire senior leadership team, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and I would like to also thank our uh, public engagement committee for um, hosting this call today. Um, I understand that um, uh, public engagement calls, these calls are very important. Um, so we are looking to continue these call on um, next year, 2022. Uh, today's discussion is on campus sexual assault and a violence prevention. And given the nature of this sensitive topic, I must warn you that this conversation may be triggering. So please, please take the time you need to take care of yourself. Um, we will be providing resources and information throughout the call. And as always, I encourage you to submit your questions in the chat feature. Um, questions, comments, if you wanna share resources, please um, use our chat box, it is open. Um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I also want to um, thank the panel panelists who's joining us today. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. Um, and with that, I'll just turn it over to Nikki, who is um, one of our members of the public engagement call, and she also um, served as government relations for the agency. Nikki. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Sullivan. Um, Again, I just want to remind you all that the chat is open, but um, your questions and comments will only be seen by the actual panelists and not the public. Uh, we do not have the capability of keeping your questions anonymous, so, so I will um, make that known. Um, so the panelists uh, are the only ones that will see your questions. Um, they will try to do their best to address them in an anonymous fashion. Um, um, we can't guarantee they will actually get to all of your questions either. Um, Kat will put in the chat um, some resources if you do have immediate emergencies, um, of phone numbers of places you can contact um, and get assistance. Um, so with that, I want to, um, yes, yeah, she put in the chat nat national sexual assault hotlines. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have a really robust, um, diverse uh, group of panelists here that come from both inst the institutional uh, perspective, community organization perspective. Yeah, sorry to interrupt Nikki, but I can't hear you for some reason. And I know that someone put that in the chat as well. Can you hear me? Okay. So Nikki, I'm I'm so sorry to hear that you're experiencing technical difficulties. And while we're addressing that, I will just go ahead and jump in and allow the panelists to introduce themselves. So Hunter, since you just spoke, would you mind um, introducing yourself to the panelists, and then we'll just popcorn through our our dynamic group. So go ahead. 
Of course. Thanks, Kat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hunter Beckstrom. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the Prevention and Sexual Exploitation Specialist at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And with that, I will popcorn it over to Laura. You are muted, Miss Laura. Apologies. All right, can everybody hear me, hear me now? It's a little quiet, but we can hear you. Apologies. Okay. I am Laura Linder Scholler. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. Um, I work as the assistant director for the Minnesota Institute for Trauma-Informed Education, which is a new initiative um, at the University of St. Thomas. I will popcorn over to Grace. All right, can everyone hear me? Wonderful. Uh, my name is Grace Rebruge. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a member of the Youth Advisory Board at Violence Free Minnesota, and I am the co-coordinator of Outreach and Communications for University Survivors Movement. Um, I will popcorn over to Yvette. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yvette Izerma. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Prevention and Social Change at Esperanza United, formerly as Casa de Esperanza. And Yes, I have to look at my layout to see who I can pop that to. Yeah. I think I might be the last one, Yvette. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tina Marisam. I um, serve as the Title IX coordinator at the University of Minnesota, um, where my role is really coordinating to make sh coordinating the university's prevention and response um, programs and processes involving sexual misconduct. And I also serve as the director of the office at the U of M that um, responds to sexual misconduct um, complaints um, and conducts the grievance process. So, really glad to be here. Are you all able to hear me now? Yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but um, thanks, Kat, for jumping in there. I, uh, what I was saying earlier um, before you all introduced yourself, yourselves was that um, the um, chat would go directly to panelists. I don't know if you heard that part and that we couldn't um, guarantee anonymity um, uh, for that. Um, so, I guess we can jump right into the questions and the 1st question is, um, what has brought us here to this point? And I believe Tina could kick us off here kind of from a title 9 uh, coordinator perspective. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so, I think. I think it's probably helpful to start um, with Title IX, um, which is one of is the primary law that regulates this space, although not the only one. Um, so Title IX is the, the federal law that prohibits sex discrimination in education. So this was like a landmark law passed in the 1970s, um, and it's super broad. It prohibits you know, sex discrimination in admissions and counseling and employment. Um, and initially it had a really big impact in athletics. Um, promoting gender equity in athletics. And then um, around the, er the 1990s, early 2000s, um, the federal government put out some guidance saying um, that this also includes sexual harassment. Title IX also prohibits sexual harassment. Um, and then around 2011, um, the federal government spoke up again um, in response, I think, in particular to some very kind of public statistics that were, I think, shocking to many, although well known in, in other communities. Um, you know, that one in four or one in five um, college age women experience sexual assault. Um, and that led the federal government to clarify again and say um, Title IX's prohibit pro prohibition on sex discrimination also includes a prohibition on sexual violence. Um, including sexual assault, um, stalking, relationship violence. Um, and so this was really a sea change. Um, it contributed um, kind of at the same time that this shift happened in Title IX, there was a huge movement of student activism, um, I think that pushed the federal government and also pushed the University of Minnesota and all other, you know, t uh, many other higher education institutions um, to try to, to focus resources on this space and to try to do better. 
And so it led to kind of Title IX offices, um, expanding staff, having more qualified staff. Um, it led to more resources for, for prevention and um, victim survivor advocacy offices. Um, it led to training for employees and students. So it really kind of shone a light um, in higher education that this was a huge problem, in fact, a public health problem, um, and that we needed to really be directing resources um, and developing best practices. And at the same time, um, I think the University of Minnesota and, and other institutions experienced a surge in reports, um, particularly from students um, who I think um, kind of the federal government speaking up and all of the student activism really had a positive impact in students who experienced sexual violence, being able to identify um, that that's what had happened to them and to feel more confidence to speak up and access resources, you know, whether that's our, you know, victim advocate um, support services or, or, or Title IX services. Um, so kind of as that was happening, we then had the Me Too movement, which was focused more on sexual harassment in the workplace, um, also a, a Title IX issue in universities with lots of employees. Um, it led at least at the University of Minnesota to a really big surge in reports of employee sexual harassment. Um, and when I say a surge in reports, I don't think that necessarily the conduct was happening more, sexual assault or sexual harassment. I think it's always, you know, been happening. Um, it's just that there was a more of a willingness to report and reach out for resources. Um, so that was kind of what was happening during the Obama era. Um, and then during the, during, um, President Trump's tenure, um, there was really huge shifts in Title IX. Um, you know, very soon after taking office, um, President Trump withdrew kind of the Obama era guidance um, and took, you know, a couple of years to put new regulations in place. Um, and these regulations tell um, all in educational institutions, not just higher ed, um, how we need to respond to sexual misconduct. And they're super prescriptive, um, very detailed about what we need to do when we see this, receive a sexual misconduct report. Um, I would say that these regulations have been extremely controversial. Um, many educational associations, including ones that the University of Minnesota were a part of, um, commented that kind of against, you know, expressed concern about the regulations during the um, open notice and comment period. Um, a big group of attorneys generals, including ours, Keith Ellison, um, submitted comments expressing concerns with the regulations. There were over 125,000 comments submitted, so they've been very controversial. Um, they're now in place, and so we've had about a year um, under these new regulations. And I would say some of the shifts are, um, they really focus on procedural fairness and due process, um, making sure that there's multiple levels of review um, of any decisions about whether someone has violated a sexual misconduct policy. Um, they also do some things that have been criticized for reducing access to the system, um, narrowed the scope of conduct that universities need to address under Title IX. Um, for example, Title IX doesn't require any longer that universities address off-campus conduct um, that's not connected to the university. Um, and there are new procedural requirements that have really been criticized as not being user-friendly and, and posing barriers for um, victim survivors. Um, in reporting and also in um, universities being able to gather evidence in these cases. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, President Biden has said that he's going to re-regulate um, and that he's going to come out with his administration will come out with proposed regulations in, in the spring that will likely be final, I'm guessing, around summer 2023. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, it's really student activism in this space has been really, really exciting. There's lots of examples of where it's pushed our institution um, into much better places. And there's been a huge renewed surge of student activism um, this year, um, both kind of criticizing the, the, the Trump era regulations um, and also a real focus on looking at Greek life um, and sexual misconduct that might occur in Greek life on campus. I, I read there's been over 100 kind of rallies or protests um, in the past few months on college campuses. So I'll, I'll stop there. That, that, that I think is where we are there, but I'd love to hear what others kind of think about the trajectory we're on.
Yeah, I mean, I'd love to expand on the student activism portion because that's really my uh, main focus. Um, just to reiterate, I am the co-coordinator of Outreach and Communications for U University Survivors Movement, and we are an international uh, coalition of student activist groups at college campuses all over the world, uh, focusing particularly in the US, UK, and the Netherlands. Um, and, you know, as Tina said, we have really seen a resurgence of um, student activism in recent years, and a lot of this was motivated by the Me Too movement. Um, you know, earlier in the 2000s, like in the early 2000s, um, there was a surge of student activism regarding sexual violence. However, there was still a very heavy stigma and risk associated with coming out with a story. Um, and then when we hit the Me Too movement, a lot of people were encouraged to share their stories publicly, uh, focusing mostly on workplace harassment. However, this posed a special kind of burden on student survivors who, for the most part, were still subject to um, backlash from not only their perpetrator, uh, but the institution that dictates not only their academics, but their housing, uh, their meal plans, um, their finances, it, it really does uh, have this overwhelming amount of control. And so for student survivors, particularly those still in college and especially those at the college where they experience sexual violence, um, there is a much uh, greater risk associated with going public with stories. And so what we've seen uh, starting following um, the murder of George Floyd, there was a uh, a massive uh, outburst of count accounts that were created of um, black students at PWIs, um, you know, BIPOC students at uh, higher education institutions submitting stories of their experiences. And what we saw was that this gave student survivors an idea on how to talk about sexual violence without necessarily um, subjecting themselves to the risks involved with going public. And so what USM saw was, um, a, a huge sudden boom of accounts that popped up at colleges and universities all over the US and then in the UK and now Netherlands, Philippines, South Africa, all over the world um, of students sharing their stories of sexual violence. Um, a lot of these stories do follow similar trends and you know it does provide an opportunity for people to see the patterns, not just in perpetrators of sexual violence, but also in institutional neglect, uh, failures within policy and how the newer Title IX regulations in the Trump administration uh, kind of disregarded accessibility issues, uh, how they treated these, you know, proceedings that are meant to be focused on institutional hearings, uh, really became criminal proceedings for many, um, allowing for issues such as cross-examination to come up, uh, subjecting survivors in particular to uh, immense trauma through the proceedings, making it uh, immensely more difficult to go through the reporting process. And so uh, what we're really seeing right now is um, a huge movement of student activists, both in high schools and colleges, um, really not just focusing on sharing their stories and destigmatizing sexual violence on their campuses, but engaging in policy. We have an amazing team of policy strategists who are currently working with um, the Department of Education at the federal level, working with um, the security offices of their schools, working with um, you know Title IX coordinators, really just trying to make policy more effective and more accessible uh, to make sure that, um, you know, not only are we providing resources and resolution to people experiencing sexual violence, but we also help to reduce it at the, you know, kind of crucial point um, and really preventing it from happening in the first place. It's, it's really a combination of the policy changes to shift the institutional reaction as well as to create the cultural shift that prevents this from happening in the first place. And so I would just like to take a moment to really, um, you know, credit where credit is due. Student activists have been carrying this issue on their back for decades at this point. And um, it, it really is amazing to me to be able to look at the people I work with and know they're not doing this full time. We're also full time students. A lot of us have jobs on the sides. Many of my colleagues aren't even planning to go into this work afterwards. They're 
pre-med students, bio majors, you know, it's, it's really intensely um, humbling to me to be able to see the um, vigor with which students around the world are addressing this issue because they know that attention must be paid if anyone is going to be safe. Thank you, Grace, and um, you all can always just jump in as you see fit. Um, uh, you mentioned um, stigma to, uh, excuse me, stigmas around reporting, and I know we kicked it off with talking specifically about Title IX, but understanding that Title IX is not always the first go-to for students. What are some other options or ways that students or individuals could report um, incidents? It, it, this is not just directed at Grace, obviously, so. And if you want to also add to that original question or anything that anyone else has already said, feel free as panelists. Yeah, I just elaborate saying, you know, um, there are a lot of directions that people can go when they first report. Um, a lot of institutions do have uh, counseling centers, resource centers that really just focus on providing healing and not necessarily uh, resolution. Um, some people will go to their public safety or law enforcement offices first to file a report. Um, and a lot of that does depend on where the assault occurred. Sometimes it falls within the local jurisdiction, other times it doesn't. Um, and, and so it is a very complicated web that can be very difficult for students to navigate because yes, there are a lot of routes that they can take, but it's very difficult for many people to choose which one or understand which is going to be the best for them, uh, which is why I think we really try to do this is to make sure that um, people know not only what their resources are that are available to them, but which ones will result in kind of which types of proceedings and, and really what are you looking to get out of this? Um, and, and that's something really important that we need to focus on. I would like to add that one reality that is very clear, especially for students of color and immigrants, is that the systems are not always the first choice to disclosure. Um, I mean, it, we already know per statistics and listening to the community that they're more likely to disclose to a friend or a family member. So this, you know, I share this to highlight the importance of having the information accessible to community too, that it's not just something that is in enclosed doors within campus, but that has to be part of the general community. Um, they're gonna go to their friends and somebody they trust rather than to a, a, a police enforcement or a system um, because of many other things. So there is fear of deportation. Um, there's also fear of perhaps losing their scholarships. Um, there's fear of letting their parents down if they have now moved across the country and they're living on campus and they're first generation student of color. Um, so there are many other nuances that come into place. So while there are very clear ways to report. They're not necessarily the best options for everyone. Um, they are community organizations like the ones that many of us represent here today um, that are not within campus that do not work for college um, that can offer support to survivors and really navigate the process in the way that is meaningful and they, they want to proceed. Not every survivor wants to report. Not every survivor wants to go to the police. Um, and I think that's one thing that we need to be to, to respect really and let the survivor guide and decide what it is that they want to do, how and when. Um, this is why it's so important for everybody to ha have access to the information, to take time to educate yourself, to know what other resources and to listen and not, ju not just jump to the cross-examination and the revictimization of survivors and then also assuming that what you think is best is gonna be best for the, the survivor. Just to jump that... on real quick, um, what Yvette and Grace have shared as well, something that Minnesota as a state does particularly well is we have excellent resources um, through local governments, through counties of trained survivor and victim advocates. So these are folks, um, this is an experience I've had personally, so I can speak to it, um, who've gone through 40 to 40 hour, 40 to 45 hours of um, state or county training to be a confidential um, survivor advocate who has no ties to institutions. Um, and their role is really to help 
uh, victim survivors identify what they need on their timelines, um, whether that's helping them make a report to their institution or work within the Title IX system, or connect to community resources. That's a um, an option that a lot of student survivors will take as a first step is identifying, you know, I don't know if I want to go through my campus system, but I'm going to go meet with someone who has training specifically around trauma response, who understands and has connections to all of the different um, outlets for reporting, including law enforcement, um, but who can connect them with some of the intermediary services that might be helpful, um, medical attention and support, counseling resources, other forms of advocates um, who can support someone maybe in a domestic violence situation with um, safety planning, things like that. And um, so there are some really great resources uh, identified even by the folks here on this panel who help folks navigate the many, many options in and outside of the campus setting. No, I'll, I'll just highlight, I mean, it's absolutely right. I mean, I've, I've heard researchers say that sexual misconduct is the most underreported crime, and it is absolutely the University of Minnesota sees that most folks who are harmed by sexual violence don't want to go through a grievance process that involves an investigation and a hearing. Um, and that's the path that we have toward kind of formal discipline um, under our policies for someone engaged in this behavior. and. Um, for a lot of reasons that we know some about, um, many folks, that is not the form of justice that they want to pursue. And I think it's really on us um, to be innovative and to find other paths to justice. And we, I mean, we certainly have, you know, confidential um, support and victim survivor advocacy resources. You know, we can provide supportive measures like, you know, pushing back tests or letting people drop classes without penalty, um, helping people move houses or apartments, you know, all of those kinds of supportive measures. But I think we have to be start thinking of other processes that maybe don't involve discipline of the respondent or the, you know, the perpetrator, um, because that requires such a lengthy process, um, but that maybe maybe offer some other way to repair the harm. Um, and we've, we've started thinking about that and we've piloted some projects, but I think that's a big project um, for all of us. Thank you. I think Hunter, did you have something to say? Yeah, thanks so much, Nikki. Uh, and just to kind of highlight something that Laura was talking about, just the importance of folks who are campus-based advocates and how those folks can be huge resources for victims and survivors who are students. But also I want to touch on that there's no type of mandated policies that every single college or university across the state of Minnesota has to have one. And so I think, first of all, just knowing that, um, you know, sometimes that students don't even have that campus based advocate that really has the uh, expertise and knowledge about unique dynamics that are happening on a college campus compared to the greater community is very important and then even. Uh, for instance, um, some of the colleges that I've attended, you know, there's about 15,000 students and there might be one single campus based advocate. And that is just not sustainable for that one person to be able to provide services for um, student victims and survivors that may have experienced violence during their time at campus. But then also uh, students might need services because they might be triggered for any variety of reasons from an earlier trauma or violence experience earlier. So really being aware of these aspects, and even if there are some local advocacy centers or rape crisis centers in that community, there are still potential barriers of transportation to those organizations. Um, there just might not be, once again, that level of expertise on specifically campus-based uh, sexual violence. Um, and in even knowing that campuses are oftentimes much more diverse than the local community around. So just kind of being aware of those impacts that even though campus-based advocates are a huge, huge resource, so many students actually don't even have access to those folks. So really trying to, as we were talking about before with student activism and legislation, really trying to push some of those attitudes as well. Just real Thank quick, you. I'd love to jump back in real, real quick here and talk about, um, you know, community organizations. And I, you know, personally cannot stress the uh, impact that they have um, you know, as, as a survivor, I first experienced sexual violence in 8th grade and then again in high school and then again in college. And because of the way that resources were inaccessible to me as a minor, it set the tone for 
the, my reaction in college. I never reported my assaults in college. I never went through the process, but I did find significant support and healing from the student activists, uh, both digitally and in person, who coordinated um, these organizations to really support other people and, you know, implementing ideas of transformative and reformative justice within institutions is massively important, but providing spaces that are just for healing that don't have the risk of mandated reporting, that don't have the risk of, um, you know, getting back to an institution. Uh, you know, all of the groups that are affiliated with university survivors movement, all of these different organizations that have a massive presence on their campuses now, none of them are affiliated with their colleges because there is a huge risk of if they are affiliated with the colleges, they may be subject to mandated reporting, they might have interference or control, uh, you know, that is exacerbated. Um, and that's a risk that a lot of student survivors are simply not willing to take. And so I, I really cannot stress the importance of having community organizations that are separate from institutions um, because they really do make a difference and they allow survivors to uh, navigate their healing in a way that is, um, you know, effective and uh, safe for them. Thank you. And also thank you for sharing your personal experience as well. Um, to kind of address some um, kind of unknowns or maybe knowns, uh, what are some common myths? And because we're post-secondary, and I also want to highlight that, um, with which is something that Grace and Yvette has mentioned, that uh, prevention and response starts well beyond college and post-secondary. Um, but be because we're obviously higher ed, um, um, this question is geared more towards like campus sexual assault, but what are some myths around that um, that you guys know of that you can provide like um, corrective information about um, to our audience? You know, Nikki, it's not, it's, it's interesting that it's presented that way because the myth are really not that much different from the myth that are overall um, around sexual violence. I mean, the re-victimization, the recriminalization of the survivor is very real, whether you're looking at sexual violence at a middle school, high school, college, outside of the education systems. Um, so it, we go back to the same things, right? Where was she at or where was the person at? Uh, were they intoxicated? What were they wearing? Um, was the other person, did you leave them on? Um, and I want to stress the intoxication one because I think that's the one that gets tagged um, mostly to college students. Um, I, I really don't know why there is this belief that youth go to college to be wild and get wasted <laughs> um, and that because they should pay a price. But whenever we hear of a college student being sexually assaulted, there is the question of um, the person was probably intoxicated. And, and, you know, if that person that's causing harm is also intoxicated too, I've heard many adults and also many youth saying, well, if both of them were intoxicated, it's okay. If the person that caused the harm was intoxicated, then it wasn't rape or then it wasn't sexual violence. We don't say the same thing when a drunk driver hits a person um, or gets into an accident. We say the person was intoxicated, therefore um, they have to be responsible for the crime they committed. Um, and, and I really stress that one out because I see that such nuance, you know, somebody intoxicated driving and they get into an accident and somebody dies, they're held responsible. Somebody's intoxicated and they sexually abuse a person and it's like, oh, well, didn't know what they were doing. They were intoxicated. Um, so th there is a double standard of what we understand. And let's be clear, just because somebody who sexually abused someone else is intoxicated doesn't make that, doesn't make it okay. They are still responsible for their actions. Not everybody that's intoxicated causes harm. Um, so that is absolutely not an excuse, and it's also not an excuse um, what the person's wearing, or if they were intoxicated at the moment that they were sexually abused, or if they were, were walking late through an alley, or if they invited somebody into their dorm. People need to be responsible for their actions, and we can be responsible for how others choose to behave around sexual um, conduct. 
I, I couldn't agree more with everything you said, Yvette, and I think we've really tried at the University of Minnesota to build into actually our written policies some kind of protective measures. Um, so, for example, we make clear in our policy that you're, you know, if you're, we don't take into consideration if someone who's engaging in harm is intoxicated, is incapacitated by drugs. We look at them as if they were sober and that's how they're held accountable. Um, we also <clears throat> have an amnesty policy so that um, anyone, you know, many college students are maybe underage or they're using illegal drugs when they're harmed. And, you know, we need to ask questions about that because if they're very incapacitated, they can't consent. Um, but we, we preface all of those questions with letting them know why we need to ask and also letting them know that under university policy, they're not going to get in trouble for that because we want people to feel free to to, to share information about the sexual misconduct they experienced. Um, we also try really hard. Um, you know, sometimes we have to ask questions in an investigation about what someone's wearing. Um, they often relate to kind of whether there was consent to remove clothing and those kinds of things. But we try to be really aware of how that might come off to the person that we're asking the question to and try to explain before we ask the question exactly why it's helpful for us to know that information. So thanks for sharing those things. I'll just add one kind of myth that I would like to address. And that is, I often hear um, communities talk about perpetrators or offenders as kind of individual bad apples. Um, and what we know is that this is a community-based problem. This is a public health problem and that sexual misconduct is most likely to occur in environments that are seen as tolerant of it. And all of us in that environment and in that community have a role to play in creating positive social norms. Um, and so it's really a community problem. It's not a problem um, of, you know, just individuals who are um, acting badly. So I, I think I'll stop there. I think one myth I'd like to address is the um, myth that after someone assaults you, you should like, like if the victim survivor continues associating with that person, it means that they were okay with it. It didn't really happen. Um, particularly when you're in college and specifically if you're in a living and learning environment. Um, I know for me, uh, my the first person who assaulted me in college lived less than 100 steps away from me. He was also in one of my classes. He was in my friend group. And I was terrified of disrupting the dynamic between my friends. I was terrified of having to switch my classes and my entire academic plan because of him. Um, and, and there's this fear of disrupting everything around you that might dictate the way that you engage with those people. Um, we see this a lot in uh, instances of relationship abuse. Um, in college, there's also a significant hookup culture. You know, um, if someone has a casual hookup thing going with someone, and then at some point consent is violated, uh, people will often look to that prior relationship as justifying it. Um, saying that, oh, well, you were intimate with them before, therefore, you know, clearly it's not a problem. Um, and, and so I think it's important to understand that it doesn't matter what the relationship is. It doesn't matter if communication continued or what the relationship is afterward. What matters is that there was an incident or a moment where consent was violated. And for many people, that response is delayed. They don't know how to react. For many people, it's new and foreign. Um, and, and we can't continue to judge people based on uh, the way that they navigate social interactions following sexual violence. I'll add to that, Grace, and thank you so much um, to, to the ones that it doesn't mean. Just because you consent that once doesn't mean that you consent that forever. Um, so, I, and I think that's something that I hear a lot also from um, police enforcement, right? Telling survivors, well, you're you're sending mixed signals because a couple of days ago you said yes, but today you say no. Consent has an expiration. It happens in the moment. And you might consent first and within five minutes decide that you don't want to. And it is okay and it is the right of everybody to say no. And if the other person doesn't stop, it is sexual abuse. So yes, um, just because you consent that one, doesn't mean that you consent it forever. And the other thing that I hear a lot is that, well, if the person didn't fight back, they must have wanted it or they must have liked it. 
Uh, there are many ways to disassociate or um, react to sexual abuse. Not everybody is going to react the same. And it's been proven already by statistics that when you fight back, when you use force, the other person can become more violent. So the fact that somebody doesn't fight back it does not equal consent and doesn't mean that they're like it. It just means they're fearful. Um, they don't want the, the person that's causing harm to get more violent. They might be disassociating from the moment. And, and that is one big thing that I hear from adults and community members that, well, the person didn't fight back. They probably enjoyed it. No, nobody enjoys sexual abuse. So that I'm going to piggyback on that and just share that in line with what Yvette and Grace shared. Something that's really exciting to me that I think has gone in line with the trajectory of student activism and movements around um, survivor rights and um, the increasing um, welcoming of reporting and cultures that support that is we now for the first time really in sexual violence prevention and response have um, a real body of research that can show us from a psychology perspective in terms of the neurobiology of trauma. We just know more than ever about what trauma and um, the body and brain's response to sexual violence and assault. We know what that looks like. And so I think something that was really helpful for me in my learning around this area is understanding that we have neurobiological research that shows that um, in addition to fight or flight as responses to trauma, any form of trauma really, but sexual violence and harassment, very normal responses are also fight, flight, fawn. And so that's, I think what Grace is speaking to is it is the body and brain's way of surviving that experience often in the context of relationships to do whatever you need to do to please that person who's perpetrating harm to survive that interaction and then um, freeze as well. So we know tonic immobility is a term that we often use for when um, someone's in the midst of a situation of violence and has that sense that like, I can't, I can't move, I can't um, continue to function or escape this situation because we know the body and brain literally shut down in order to protect themselves. And so I think the more information that we have um, that is science-based, data and research founded um, about what that actually looks like helps inform campus and also just cultural understandings of um, breaking down some of those myths around survivorship and sexual violence. And I, I think we're seeing that play out in a, a larger cultural context too um, in breaking down some of the myths or must, myth understand, misunderstandings, excuse me, um, around um, let's say delays in reporting, um, for example. And so this cultural understanding that why would someone wait to tell someone or to report an experience of sexual violence? Um, and what we actually know is that for campus um, contacts and populations in particular, I think the, um, the average length of time between an incidence of sexual violence and someone reporting that um, or sharing, telling anyone, so a friend, family member, campus authorities, law enforcement, the average amount of time is eight months. Um, we know for younger individuals that uh, is actually an average of years, right? So if someone is assaulted as a young child, we know because of all of the forces that folks have spoken to, um, there are significant, significant barriers to sharing and reporting. So the more that we know about what that looks like helps inform our campus systems um, for understanding, welcoming, and supporting folks when they are ready to tell someone or access resources of support. Thank you. Um, and to that, just to mention something. So the uh, Minnesota implemented a um, campus sexual assault report that our agency um, post and also tied with that was a campus sexual violence and prevention coordinator who Laura used to uh, serve it in that role at our agency and we're currently in the process of hiring. Um, um, and that's something that can be found on our agency website uh, to kind of address what Laura was saying um, about information and how uh, campuses and colleges could do a better job of reacting and responding um, to students. Um, 
But what what are um who are other players involved in addressing sexual violence? And I want to say on campus, but I'm gonna stop saying on campus because, like you all mentioned, it's broader than the college uh like realm. Um, and then in addition to that, what are some strategies? I know you all have mentioned some, um already, but some strategies that have been working in um, preventing sexual assault and violence on campus and also the response to it, because I know we're um, survivor centered on this call. So I want to uh, keep that uh, that focus as well. Um, but yeah, so like who are other players involved? Obviously your organizations, um, uh, but also what are some strategies that are working and then to close us out, because we're close to time too, if you want to also um, provide, like, what are some ways that faculty members, community members, and K-12 staff um, can be proactive um, in preventing sexual violence in, um, on college and beyond and prior to. So I know that was a lot, but um, feel free to answer whatever I asked. <laughs> um. Nikki, I'll hop in really quick um, just to, sort of piggyback on my last thought about what we know about the research around sexual violence prevention and response. So one of the things that, that is very clear from the last few decades of research specific to education, K-12 and campuses, is that one of the most effective forms of sexual violence prevention, and that's rape, assault, harassment, bias, discrimination, um, is comprehensive sexual health and relationship education. So it's having real science-based conversations about healthy relationships, about consent, about um, what's okay and what's not okay. And that uh, can take the form of any age and um, level of development appropriate conversations, but really talking um, directly with kids from as young of an age as possible. So this is work that happens and needs to happen long before students get to college campuses. Um, but we know that that's one of the best preventative measures um, for sexual violence in all of its forms. I'll piggyback on what Laura said. Yes, please start prevention early. College, high school, it's already too late. We know that by age 16, about 25% of girls have already experienced sexual violence. So by the time they get to college, you're really working in educating survivors. Um, and I think that's one of the things that colleges and campuses need to understand that you're already working with survivors. Your approach needs to be very much trauma informed. Um, so starting in middle school, whatever that means for the state and the county you're in, you know, that could be fourth, fifth grade. And yes, to the comprehensive sex education, please. I mean, it's very difficult for you to understand what's not okay if they don't have an idea of what is healthy. So not only teaching youth to what it's not okay, what's not acceptable, but actually what is a healthy relationship? What is healthy um, sexuality, right? What it's okay, knowing your body, knowing what it is that you're experiencing, and talking to youth about it doesn't mean that they're gonna run off um, and do things that parents maybe are not ready for their children to do. It is about putting the information in the hands of the youth so that they can make informed decisions. So yes, to the start early, um, even in preschool, if it's necessary, I think there, there's many things that are relatable to consent to healthy relationship with your friends, your peers, your family members, and other adults in your life that it's about developing those skills to know how to relate and how to be in a significant relationship with another person when you're older. Yeah, and I 100% agree with that, you know, early education is absolutely necessary for folks, but we also know that that's so unfortunately not the reality for so many people. And I know that a lot of college institutions, uh, for instance, do like a 45 minute educational workshop on consent during like first year student orientation week. And I think that can truly be revolutionary for some students who have really have no concept of healthy relationships or consent. Uh, but knowing that, um, you know, looking at the reality of that situation, that those students are so busy, they're hopping from one educational workshop to the other, uh, quite honestly, a lot of students um, are just trying to make friends, uh, create connections, and might even be hungover, not paying attention, right? That's just the reality that people are experiencing. And so uh, these one-time presentations might only push the meter a little bit, 
but we really want to have those consistent, repetitive uh, cultural change and behavioral change, right? We want to have that uh, educational and thought process change, but it's really important to have that behavioral change for having an entire community uh, and have a culture of consent, right? Because we know that the majority of behavioral cues to quote unquote get consent are all nonverbal. And even when we're talking about affirmative action, so actually getting that uh, verbal yes from someone, we know that there can be coercion, power dynamics in which people say yes, but that they really mean no, right? Because they feel pressured, coerced, threatened for however many different reasons. And so that's why we really have to go deeper into talking about the realities of consent. And once again, talking about the importance of student activism, but people who have influence and authority on campuses, such as professors, such as administration, the culture of creating a, a safe environment has to come from everyone, right? Because uh, to me, the goal is prevention, right? So I am a preventionist. That is what my passion is. And the goal is to reduce all types of harm, right? Not only sexual violence, but uh, systemic and oppression harms, for instance, racism, uh, transphobia, homophobia, because we know that any person in the world can experience sexual violence, right? So we really need to be able to create uh, healthy and thriving communities, right? Because that also pushes out experiences of violence as well. Yeah, I'd just like to double on that and, you know, especially what Yvette said, um, just because you don't talk about it doesn't mean that it isn't happening. Um, I, I can confidently say that I did not hear the words consent or sexual assault from a parent, teacher, or administrator until I was a freshman in college. That didn't stop me from experiencing sexual violence. Not talking about sex, sexuality, and consent only creates more possibility for violence. We actually conducted an informal survey of uh, a group of survivors that we work with at USM, and we found that approximately 70% of them had not received any formal sex education that included any discussion on consent. And that's a huge problem. It results in people experiencing lifelong trauma. And so it's not about, um, you know, whether kids are gonna go out and have sex or not. Would you rather have a child going out and having positive, healthy experiences or being subjected to lifelong trauma? That's really the choice that we're making when we decide whether or not to provide our youth with comprehensive sex education. And so it's, it's really a no brainer. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, I mean, I think there's, we need more research about what's effective in prevention, um, even around training, what kind of training is effective. We need a lot more research. I mean, I think what we know now is, you know, bystander intervention work um, is promising, um, working on social norms, helping people on um, creating positive social norms is really positive. There's research showing that like students way, um, think way more other students are having kind of hookup sex than is the actual case, right? Think other students are drinking way more heavily than is the actual case. And if we were able to just provide information about what the actual social norms are, that is promising and kind of creating culture change. And I, I agree with Hunter that we all need to be thinking about this. I, I heard something really interesting that one school is doing that their facilities management, they're like space management people are thinking about how's the way we allocate space impact whether sexual misconduct is likely to happen. And one thing they thought about is, you know, students come back from parties or bars or, you know, they're out with their friends and they want to continue the gathering and the only place they have to go is their dorm room with the bed right there and the door closed. And, you know, what if we provide a 24 hour social space that they could go to instead that would kind of would maybe shift the culture a little bit more, um, which I thought was just innovative and the, the way we need to continue kind of thinking big picture um, about things we can do to shift culture. Well, I wish we had more time. Obviously, this is a big topic to discuss. Um, but like I said, we will share you all's uh, contact information. Um, 
uh, some of the resources you all mentioned, your organizations, um, with uh, in a follow up email to all attendees. Also, this call was recorded and, and will be posted on our public engagement website for the agency. And I just want to really thank you all for your expertise, your time, uh, the information you shared, um, and your courage for sharing your personal stories and stories that you have um, heard. Uh, we, um, this topic. Uh, was important for various reasons, but also because students are whole people and we um, shouldn't also just focus on academics. Um, I hope you guys can still hear me. Okay. <laughs> so, um, with that, I just, like I said, I want to thank you all. I also want to thank those that um, attended and listened in live, but also if you didn't get a chance to hear the great conversation, you will be able to um, go back and listen to the recording. Um, also, there's a survey at the end of this call, so it's helpful for our PE team. Um, if you do complete the survey, it helps us understand um, what worked, what didn't work, and also what you want to hear from us or the agency in the future. And we we always try to get students and experts in whatever the topic you all want to hear and know more about. Um, so thank you. And with that, I guess we can close the call. And I appreciate you all again. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good to meet you all.